This is Geeks Unleashed, episode 29. Hello, welcome to Geeks Unleashed, episode 29. I'm Mark. And I'm Jasmine. Each week we cover the news of the week and we pick a couple of things to review that caught our fancy in TV, comics, movies and games. This week's news, you can see our previous episode, episode 28, that came out yesterday because there was so much of it. Um, And this week's reviews are getting their own episode and we are reviewing the first six uh, issues of That Texas Blood from Image Comics and Batwoman season one, all 20 episodes on The CW. And spoiler warning, this is a review show. So if you have not had a chance to read That Texas Blood issues one through six, or watch the first season of Batwoman, you might want to pause this and come back later. Uh, And then at the very end, we'll give you a couple of recommendations of our own. And jumping straight into it, That Texas Blood, issues one through six from Image Comics. It is written by Chris Condon. The art, which is the inks and the colors, are by Jacob Phillips, uh, who actually has a connection to something that we've done before. He is the son of Sean Phillips, who was the uh, illustrator on Pulp, which was written by Ed Brubaker that we reviewed earlier in the year. Um, so that Texas Blood, again, six stories. What, what was actually pretty unique about this comic is it, it will be an ongoing, but they had a single story arc that they were telling in these first six issues, and it is completely wrapped up in volume one. Um, so it is, it's not like a leave you hanging to come back later or any, anything like that. Um, the story so far, it's split between two main characters, uh, Sheriff Joe Bob Coates and Randy Terrell. Uh, it takes place in a sleepy county in West Texas called Ambrose County. Joe Bob is a pretty laid back guy. Everybody around town knows the sheriff and it seems like they all know him on a personal level. Uh, And per the author, the locale was inspired by a friend of theirs whose family is from Fort Davis, Texas to give anyone who is either a Texan or is looking at a map, some perspective. Fort Davis is sort of between El Paso and San Antonio and Midland. Um, So basically Fort Davis is in the middle of nowhere. Sorry, guys. Um, (laughs) One of the scenes that actually jumped out at me in the very first book at the very beginning is there's a scene where someone calls the sheriff out to their house to kill a rattlesnake. And honestly, it is one of the most authentic Texas things I can think of because there's also the the woman who called the sheriff is wearing a shirt that says uh, everything is bigger in Texas. And someone once asked me, because I, I am from Texas, and someone once asked me, like, do you guys actually wear your own state? Like, do you wear, like, Texas-themed clothing? And I was like, yes, yeah, yeah, we do. Like, I wear Texas stuff that says Texas all the time on it. Um, but the fact that they call the sheriff to come and kill a rattlesnake, and the sheriff is trying to kill the rattlesnake with a shovel, but the couple, the man and the woman whose house this actually is, are sitting on the porch and they're yelling at the sheriff while he's trying to kill the rattlesnake. And they're like, why don't you just shoot it? And he's like, well, why don't you just let me take care of this my way? And I kid you not, I have actually killed a snake in my parents' backyard with a machete. And it was literally one of those conversations that my mom and I had where she was like, well, why don't we shoot it? or I can get the hoe. (laughs) And I was like, no, no, it's fine. It's cool. I got my machete. I'll do this. Um, So I got such a kick out of that because I was like, yeah, I've totally, I've totally done the whole, how do we kill the snake? Should we kill it with a gun? Should we kill it with the shovel? Should we kill it with the machete? Like, how are we going to do this? So right from the very beginning, this book had me hooked because I felt, (laughs) I felt seen after the rattlesnake sequence. Um, I love it. They, they, when they said that, I'd shoot it. They're like, do you want to come down here and help me then? Like, you know, <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. So it was just, it's really fun. Like, it's totally not related to the story at all. This couple never comes back into the story. Um, but that one scene was was really what kind of endeared the book to me as a Texan. Now, the author, neither the author nor the illustrator are Texan. Chris Condon, this is actually his first book, uh, and, and Jacob Phillips, it's their first book. Uh, Chris is from Jersey, but now he lives in LA, and Jacob is British. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I thought that they nailed that pretty much. 
So kudos to you guys for nailing that from a, from a native Texan, that rattlesnake scene was right on the money. Um, so that, but that was one of the things that really jumped out at me in the book. It's the details. Uh, it, it's, there are no cliche Texas things. No one is riding around in this book on horses. Nobody is spitting tobacco. Like there's none of that stuff that you see in Western movies and think like, oh, all Texans are like that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed that they kind of got the nuance, especially of West Texas. Now I didn't grow up in West Texas. I actually uh, grew up in, in and around the Houston area and Houston is the fourth largest city in the country. So I'm definitely a city girl, um, but I have been through West Texas several times and it, it, the nuance of West Texas is something that they were able to capture in the story, which is kind of surprising, um, but it's, it's really fun to kind of read it because again, you, I, it's something that I can relate to, even though I can't relate to the, the actual plot points of the story, but like the details and, and the background is kind of what pulls me in. So um, even though Joe Bob kind of rides through town, he's you know doing all these mundane tasks, uh, but it's really clear that there's something sinister just below the surface. Um, and it's, it's not something that anyone specifically says. It's, it's all kind of portrayed through conversations that allude to one thing or another. Um, so the, the conversations that they have in this book also feel really authentic and not, not just like writing to get to the next page. It actually feels like conversations that people would have with each other. Um, so it, it's, again, it's not so much in, in the artwork and, and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's just the conversations in, in this book really kind of stand out more so than the monologues do. Um, and by the end of the first book, we kind of get to the point where it's like, oh, now we have a story because now we have a dead body. Um, and it's kind of intriguing because that, that de death came out of nowhere. Um, it, nobody is sad that this death happened because the guy is, is a real piece of trash. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, it almost feels like nobody's going to miss him. But at the same time, it's kind of like, it's the oh shit moment that happens at the end of this first book that you're like, yep, I'm going to keep reading because I really want to know what happens next. So this, the first issue is kind of a slow burn, gets you used to the characters, is laying the scene, setting, uh, you know, setting up the town. By the second issue, the second issue starts with a dead body on like the second page. Um, so they find a dead body on the side of the road. And that's where we meet, the second book is where we meet the second main character, Randy. He has sort of like a, a dream or a vision of his brother in his apartment, uh, which kind of he wakes up and he's like, oh my God. Uh, and his girlfriend is like, what, what happened? And he's like, did you see that? <laughs> and she's like, see what? And so now he thinks that he's seeing things, but it's really kind of, creepy because he he gets this vision of his brother before he knows that his brother has actually been killed there's a line that says um like guilt it haunts yeah. by, um which i thought yeah. was quite quite good in reflection it was quite good yeah and one of the things that's kind of great is they don't ever tell you why uh randy's brother was so hated but whatever Randy's brother did, it drove Randy out of town. So Randy left town and never, ever went back once he moved to L.A. So him going back to town um, to kind of figure out what happened with his brother is the first time he's been back in a really long time. But none of the townspeople have forgotten who his brother is. So as he's going through the town, he gets all this flack from everybody that he runs into. But it's all directed at him because of actions that his brother has done um so like people are indirectly mad at him just because they're related uh which to me is a very kind of small town mentality like news spreads really fast in small towns and people hold grudges forever grudges are generational um so it's it it kind of sucks for him because again he managed to escape but now he's back uh so he heads back to a small town but he can't even bring himself to go to like his old parents house so he stays at a hotel now the, the second book is just kind of introducing you to Randy. By the time we get to the third book, that's when things really kind of start moving. Um, so I wouldn't, it's, it's not like breakneck pace, but it does, it does pick up a significant clip by the, by the time we get to the third book. So um, in the third book, we, he, Randy uh, finally, you know, at the end of the second book, the sheriff finally is like, well, your brother is dead. Like, I don't know why you thought you came to town, but like your, your brother's dead. 
So now Randy has to digest the fact that his brother is actually dead and he has no idea who killed him, but he has a hunch. Uh, Randy ends up hooking up with an old fling. Uh, the same day that he does that, he gets kidnapped um, and then he gets beaten by an old rival. And all of this happens within the span of, of, of this one book. But I think book three is kind of where the, the chance that the art really has uh, its time to shine. There are several pages where it's nothing but scenery that just kind of like the west texas barren scenery with the with the quintessential pictures of the davis mountains in the background um but it's really just kind of like this empty expansive beauty uh so i really really love the art in the third book um there's also uh, a, a point in time where when jacob is kind of differentiating between life in la and life in west texas the coloring that he uses for all of the LA sequences are, is really vibrant, really bright, really colorful. Um, lots of like pastels and neon type colors. But when he gets back to the West Texas part, it's all kind of muted. It's, you know, blues and, and hues of orange and kind of just lots of dust and rusty type colors. So it's, it's really interesting the contrast that they use between Randy's LA girlfriend coming to Texas to check on him versus the scenery in west texas and it's it's apparent from the very beginning that she does not fit in here um so by the fourth book it's sort of like randy is now on his full-on downward spiral there there's no turning back you can see that a switch has flipped um he had been sober for a while he starts drinking again and when he starts drinking again, that's when things start to go bad. He starts to form all of these ideas in his head about what happened with his brother and who might have been responsible. Um, and I mean, with no sort of evidence, no proof, just again, it's a grudge. You've had a grudge against this person pretty much your whole life. And because that person has been awful to you, you assume you have to be the guy. You, you're the guy that killed my brother. I know you are. So he sets out on this revenge plan and suddenly goes from this sort of mysterious writer with a very haunted past to an active like dirtbag. I mean, he, the guy who kidnapped him, Randy has now gone on and kidnapped and killed that guy and has him stashed in his parents' basement. Um, he, he just kind of begins to go off the deep end and there's no stopping him from coming back from that. But he is literally just kind of, like Mark said earlier, yeah, guilt haunts like he is haunted by his own demons that again he's making assumptions he he doesn't know what's going on he he doesn't there are no clues there is no evidence nobody has any fingers to point at anyone as to who killed his brother um so while randy is kind of like on his downward spiral the sheriff is starting to piece piece the pictures together and because the sheriff knows everybody in the town it's very easy for him to come to different conclusion than randy did so the sheriff starts to put pieces together and it turns out the fling that randy hooked up with uh in one of the earlier books she was also hooking up with his brother and she's the one who killed his brother not the rival but by the time you find that out it's too late because randy has killed the rival killed a bar owner killed like he's by the end of the book six randy has five murders on his head um and it's just kind of like but why? I mean, I, I can understand the animosity that you had as, a, as this person was your rival. You guys have a bad history together, but you had no proof. No, ev there was nothing pointing to this guy as the killer other than your internal hunch. Like he didn't like my brother. He didn't like me. Therefore you killed my brother. Um, and to me, by the time I finished the story, it sort of reminded me of no country for old men. Um, just because it was like, nobody, nobody gets a happy ending here. Nobody. Like, at the end of the book, Randy and the fling, her name was Sarah, are in the back of a squad car together being taken to county jail. Randy for murdering five people. Actually, they pinned six murders on Randy, which the sixth murder was done by someone else, but nobody knows that. Um, so six murders pinned on Randy and one murder pinned on his ex-girlfriend. And it's just kind of like, for what you you didn't even bother to ask anyone any questions when you were in town you didn't listen to the sheriff you did you didn't do any real legwork any investigative work about any of this you kind of just had this idea in your head and you just went on a rampage um 
but the, the story it's I, pulpy seems like the wrong word but it's the word that comes to mind uh, like it kind of reminds me also of preacher the, the body count is not as high as preacher uh but it's 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 the kind of story where it's so the main character is so in their own head that it's almost like they're living in a different reality than than we are as the readers because nothing that he's doing is making any sense but you can see you can see his rationality just like going out the window um but i think that's what was so fascinating about it it was it was just watching this train wreck and you couldn't turn away and you knew you knew exactly what was going to happen by the end of the book because i think pretty much by the fifth book as the reader you know that the guy that randy's after is not the guy who killed his brother um but th- but there's nothing to pull Randy back from the edge. There's nothing to pull him back to say, "Hey, take a step back, look at this objectively, and and you know, let's go from there." But also, it's it's there's so many things that are up in the air that you just start forming all of your own conclusions. Like you obviously you weren't that close to your brother because you left town and you never went back. Like, did did you talk to your brother on a regular basis? Did you guys wish each other happy birthday? Did you? talk to each other on holiday like did any of those things happen or did you bail at 18 and just never ever ever come back to town i mean what happened that you left but at the same time if you left obviously it couldn't have been on good terms because you didn't even want to come back here so now what makes you so hell-bent on revenge when it didn't even seem like you had that close of a relationship with your brother in the first place um I don't know. Uh, start to finish, I really just, I just enjoyed this book. I, I thought it was, it was a, it was a nice pace. It was a pleasant read. I'm glad I read everything all at once. I think it would have been much harder to keep my attention if it had been, if I had started one, one issue at a time. Uh, but reading it kind of collected was, was definitely the way to go. But also like reading it all in one sitting collectively, I don't feel like I lost out on any of the feeling of the slow burn that the story is trying to uh that the author is trying to lay out um so it just oh uh, it's almost like a story about nothing but it just this is this is probably one of the best comics that i've read collective like first issue or first volume since uh we read adventure man i would say yeah, yeah, it was a good approach we took to Adventure Man as well, reading that all in one sitting. Yeah. And with this as well, reading it all in one sitting. I remember, every, so I saw the first issue or two issues, whatever, on the shelf. And I didn't pick it up for whatever reason. And then we both decided to go back and get all six issues. And um, I actually think it was played off really well to actually sit down and read this all in one go. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think the first three issues were definitely slow burn, where, the fir- where issues four to six suddenly sped up a lot um i was a little bit disappointed by the speed up until you told me i hadn't realized that that from issue seven will be a second arc which will actually be like a flashback to the sheriff like when he was younger yeah uh, which kind of explains this weird Yeah, because they literally completely wrap up this story this brandy story is done 100 percent done by the end of well, issue six. well i guess we don't know if it's a hundred percent done because we oh, i don't know well yeah. he might or whether he's going to pick up on it in jail or well i guess for the but but for the but the storyline of the who done it type thing that's done mm-hmm. um but i guess we don't know if randy's gone for good so to speak um which who knows like you know um there, so there is a comment here by the author in the back of the first issue that this is based off of a 90-page screenplay that you wrote um, and that this issue essentially is the first third of the original script. Um, and he said, however, the, we won't be getting the two-thirds until this comes to a close. Um, so I found that quite strange as well. So what we're saying is that this first issue is literally the first third of a movie um, and then... I guess what would be, I don't, I don't know where this who done it bit fit in. Like, was it going to be just five minutes suddenly, suddenly in the middle of the book? And then, and then was there another whole other arc? Like, you know, was maybe the who done it part wasn't necessary. So, well, because I guess issues two to five 
may not have even been in the main script because it obviously we don't get that murder of, of of the brother until the beginning of issue two so yeah. maybe that maybe this story arc was created just purely for the comics that'd mm-hmm. be quite actually that'd be quite interesting to know i'm, I'm assuming it probably was because if this was the first third of the movie and then the next two thirds of stuff we're going to get as they're ready to close the book out yeah, yeah quite intrigued to see see where this goes and it, it sounds like it's going to be a bit, a bit like fargo in terms of jumping around and showing the history of the town and the characters right um and there was a there was a sort of a three pager in the middle of issue one which was a flashback to the sheriff when he was younger um, yeah. which kind of was a little bit out of nowhere but i'm assuming looking at this in reflection yeah. yeah that we'll get to understand that because i was really thrown off by that i was like well, what's going on like, yeah and i then- think it helped like like you we were talking before we started recording i don't always read the extra notes that are at the back of the book mm. when i'm done but i did this time and i'm glad that i did because the author explains at the end of the sixth book like okay well that's it that's randy's story and we'll definitely be back not next month but we will be back in a couple of months and we're going to focus on sheriff uh joe bob and we're going to but we're going to go back in time to kind of give you an idea of how joe bob got to the point where he is when you meet him in the first book um which which i think is is super helpful because like you said (laughs) it's one of those things where you get to the end of book six and you're like oh well what happens now like you Randy's going to jail. The the you you found out who killed his brother. Like, what what are we gonna do next? So I I really appreciated that there was an explanation as to what's gonna happen in in book seven or at the beginning of book seven. So, um, yeah, this this kind of story. It's not the kind of story that like jumps out at you. Like we read King and Black. I would say what was that last week? Um, yeah. And King in Black was one of those things. It was very much in your face action from the very beginning. But that, and that action is what kept you going from page to page to page. This series does not jump out at you, but it is that kind of story that like slowly starts to permeate. And the longer you're away from it, the more you go back and you think like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why did the sheriff say this? Or why does everybody in the town kind of have a tongue-in-cheek attitude about this? So it's it's a kind of story that comes back to you um, when when you're done with one book, waiting for sort of the next one. Like it it makes you ask all of these questions. Um, so it's it was really kind of it was a really a real treat to read because again, it was not like the in your face, but it was definitely. Gosh, it sounds weird. Like you can't call it a page turner, but. The, but I I couldn't put it down. I mean, once oh, I started really, I, reading, I literally read everything in one sitting. I mean, I was uh, sitting on my couch for a few hours just getting through all six of these books. I really did love it. I and I think you said earlier about the little moments. I loved. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there was two. There was three things in the first issue that jumped out at me, and this kind of kind of plays out throughout the, out the next. Well, not issue six because issue six I thought was quite fast, but like um, the slow moments I really enjoyed as much as the main story, and I think that's where. Um, I appreciate that a lot more. Like, you know, I know you weren't a big fan of the Queen's Gambit, but I love those slow moments that that show the character not necessarily adding to any overall largeness of a story. But like um, in the first issue, there was three, three things that I really loved. One was this whole thing about getting the casserole dish, really <laughs> make, really yes. making this whole thing about casserole dish. And I was like thinking, it's just like real life, you know, like... Mm-hmm. Um, I've had this several times before where my wife's nan has sent her a dish like, and then I've reused it. And then my wife's like, Oh, why have you reused that? I just cleaned that to give that to my nan. Like, you know, and <laughs> like, you know, or whatever, or, you know, like that kind of thing. And like, that's kind of like real life stuff. And then, um, and then there's this thing where the, the sheriff goes into uh, the convenience store and he's like picking up beef jerky or fruit and beef jerky or fruit. And he's like, mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know what, which one to get. And like, and those are like little things like I've got into a shop and well, we've probably all gone into shops and like, oh, should I get the fruit or should I get the sausage, you know, like or whatever, yeah. like, you know, or, you know, the, you know, the, the, un- you know, the fried meat or the, or the actual, you know, or the apple or whatever, or, or, you know, sometimes when you've been at lunch, it's like, should I get the McDonald's or should I go and get, <laughs> or should I get the salad? And you're right, like, right. Mm, the McDonald's. Like, yeah. and, like, and, uh, like, but you know, that that's what endears you to the sheriff. Like there, 
I think it's this easily could have been one of those stories that just kind of ruins it for you. Like I, I said, it reminded me of No Country for Old Men. I actually hated No Country for Old Men because it it kept killing off the characters that I got attached to. And I think mm. if if this story had killed off Joe Bob, I would have been really pissed, and I probably would not have wanted to finish. But Joe Bob is so endearing as the sheriff. He's almost like an everyman. Like there's definitely someone in your life that you can say, oh, Joe Bob reminds me of such and such. You know, like he's he's so familiar and he's just he's so charming that it's impossible not to like him. So him sort of being the thread throughout all six of these books uh, was was the glue that kind of kept the story together. Um and also because well, it felt like he could pull himself out of the heat of the moment and kind of take a step back and look at things a little bit more rationally. Like he didn't, he never lost his temper. He never got overly emotional. Like he, he had his own issues. Like you said, there was a one sequence in the first book where he kind of had nightmares, but whenever he had a nightmare, he just got up and went to work on model planes. Like, you know, he didn't go to the kitchen and drink a whole bottle of Jack Daniels. He, he just kind of did something to take his mind off of it, you know? um so So. it's the characters in this book like you you just get they they work their way in into your psyche sort of i've not read um much combined work of ed uh brubaker and sean phillips um other than what we said earlier we read pulp i think it was in august and um and then but i had read um the whole run of kill or be killed by ed brubaker and sean phillips and this book feels so much like kill or be killed and i haven't read much of their other stuff which i should really go back and read criminal and or or some of their criminal work um but kill or be killed felt so artistically the same type of theme like i mean it was i mean kill or be killed, killed is set in new york but it it honestly felt like the same kind of pace like um and and obviously knowing that sean um uh, Sean's son is in this and um uh, Sean's son sorry color is is the illustrator behind this um uh, Jacob Phillips and you, you, he was the colorist obviously on their other work like um as well so you could see the style um you could see how like obviously they must work really well together and mm-hmm. taking that take you know take you know almost t- learning from learning from his parents I guess and um I don't know, just everything about this book, I really enjoyed it. And like you say, yeah, okay, it's not an action-packed um, King, you know, King in Black type stuff, but this is a really good six-issue story arc. Mm-hmm. And although I felt like the six-issue was a little bit suddenly come to an end, uh, I actually do quite like that we have had an end. Um, although, and then I was like, well, what's going to happen in issue seven? So, But I like the fact that we are going to jump back and probably find out the mystery of that weird sequence in issue one about that sort of yes who is walt and and why did we even bring walt into the story but do you know what i was thinking like when i was watching this uh reading it sorry when i was reading this and about the screenplay i thought to myself this would make a perfect tv show like this would be which makes you wonder like why why did he have such a hard time after like turning this into a screenplay or maybe Maybe, maybe people weren't involved Maybe, maybe, maybe heading it for a movie wasn't the best approach. But the comic has been comic is always a great medium. Comics are always a great medium. But um, handing this over to a TV series down the road would be amazing. But I'm I'm ha- I'm here for the ride. I don't want to see this out. I'm happy to carry on with this book. Um, I would definitely carry on reading it. Oh yeah, uh, I want to you- know more about Joe Bob. Yeah. So, um, so bringing this review to a conclusion, um, as you know, we rate things out of five and for comics, we split that rating for artwork and story. So artwork, we've given this four out of five and for story four out of five. Yeah. Also one, one more tiny detail thing. So the first book, the first few pages, the first vehicle you see is a Ford F-150, which again, made me laugh as a native Texan. When I was 16, my first vehicle was an F-150. And now my brother, who is quite a bit younger than me, but my brother, his first car was also an F-150, which is a pickup truck. And I just got such a kick out of that because you can throw a stone in Texas and probably hit five or six F-150s along the way. Um, so again, the detailing in this book is great. So yeah, four, four for the story, four for the art. We loved this book. 
So moving on to um, find the thing um so moving on batwoman season one on the cw which is based off characters created by jeff johns grant morrison greg rucker mark wade and keith giffen uh the series was developed by carolyn dries and the total episode count was unfortunately 22 20 sorry <laughs> 20 and was meant to be 22 however covid 19 aka 2020 um <laughs> everyone just all year oh, 2020 like you know it uh, yeah it brought brought the show to a, a slightly earlier finish and gave it a different cliffhanger ending than had been planned it stars cam run cameras johnson as luke fox rachel Scarston as Alice, Megan Tandy as Sophie Moore, and Nicole Kang as Mary Hamilton, uh, Doug, Doug, Doug Gray Scott as Colonel Jacob Kane, and of course, Ruby Rose as Kate Kane. Me and Jasmine have decided to take a different approach with our review for season one. One we've not tried before, so this could either go really well or explode in our faces. <laughs> uh, we've decided to not review this in the traditional way that we normally review stuff. We've decided to break down the show into our dislikes and likes. So we've got five of each. Kick it off. All right. We're kicking it off with the things that we did not like first. So in, I mean, in no particular order, but the five of the five things that I did disliked the most, I hated that nobody, nobody in this entire series listened to Alice when she said, Beth is never coming back. And it it was apparent, like something happened to her after the car crash and but, but nobody believed that everybody saw what they wanted to see. Kate kept seeing her sister, her twin sister. But Alice was very much like, look, I know, I know what you see when you look at me, but I am telling you that the girl that was in that car is dead and gone and she is not coming back, but nobody listened. And by the time everything hits the fan at the end of the season, it's kind of like, Oh, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm so hurt that Alice burned me. And it's like, she has literally been telling you this entire season that she is not Beth and that Beth is not coming back, but you didn't listen. And because you didn't listen to her, like all of these sequence of things keep happening. And it's like, she's not your sister. I mean, she is still technically your sister, but she is not the Beth that you remember. The Beth that you remember is gone and you need to accept that this person in front of you now is Alice, the serial murderer that is terrorizing Gotham City. So the thing that I didn't like, and I know it can be helped, but I did not like that the Ruby Rose and the CW couldn't have come to some understanding one way or the other Mm -hmm. to finish off her story. So as you may have heard in the news, Ruby Rose and the CW had some sort of falling out um, whilst filming and have parted ways. And Kate Kane, AKA Batwoman is not returning to Batwoman in season two. And so when it ends at the end of episode 20, um, And I'm assuming it probably would have been the case uh, episode 22 that Kate Kane's story is not finished. And I've we've both seen the trailer. We'll come to the trailer of season two later, but she's been completely replaced and she's gone and it's going to be some sort of off screen death. Now what annoys me about this is there's so much like that was planned, you know, so Sophie, her ex-girlfriend, um, you know, kind of love of their lives, so to speak. Um, they're they're never going to find out that she was Batwoman. Well, I'm assuming that she probably will find out in season two that she was Batwoman, but we're not going to have that on-screen confrontation, like, oh my God, you're Batwoman. Um, And also, like, the fact that her dad, who's the leader of the Crows, you know, who clearly, who who absolutely hates Batwoman with every fibre of his being, is never going to have that big reveal that actually yeah. that's his daughter, right, right. Which, which was probably going to be amazing. I just wish they could have come to some understanding. And even if they had to rewrite the scripts for episodes 21 and 22. Now, 
the blacklist they managed to put together a half live action animated finale could we not have had you know them all just doing the voices from home and put together two animated episodes i would have watched them hands down so i did not like that you know i know other shows had to finish early and and but they're going to pick up their stories in in their following seasons but because Ruby Rose and the CW came to some sort of fallout or had some sort of fallout, I wish they could have come to an understanding that, you know, and for the fans, given us an ending that isn't off screen. Yeah, it's it's going to be super weird, I think, like, because based on the trailer, it's like Gotham is sort of thrown into chaos again because Batwoman has disappeared. Mm. Like, so how, how do you just explain that away? I mean... Does she get kidnapped? Does she run away? Like what, what I'm very interested to see how they make Kate Kane go away. Um, okay. Uh, another thing, I guess it's connected to my first issue is the idea that everybody puts this heavy, heavy weight on the value of family and that your blood relatives are more important than your found family or any family that you kind of build around yourself as you get older. Um, and that really, really annoyed me. And you can see it with, obviously with Kate and you know her father and with Beth, where it's kind of like the whole time Alice is basically like, you guys gave up on me. And Kate's like, no, no, I never gave up on you. And her dad is like, well, yeah, no, I totally gave up on you because, you know, I, I wanted to move on with my life. <laughs> um, but like the, the fact that Kate holds on to that blood tie so much and she has Mary, who's her stepsister, right there with her this entire time. And they've been, you know, they've been stepsisters since since they were kids. I mean, um, they, they were they grew up together right after pretty much her father got remarried. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was some kind of animosity toward her just for the fact that she had just lost her sister, but you, you have a relative like granted again, you're not related by blood, but you're related by marriage and, and you just throw that connection out the door um, in favor of you chasing down the ghost of your sister who, who really doesn't exist anymore. Um, and you can also see the same kind of connection with, Mary and her mother where Mary like rebels against her mother because it's it's like she can never get her mother's approval on anything that she's doing um and I just it it irks me to no end because it's like you have you know as as Mary you have Kate and and now you have Luke like you have a group that is there for you that supports you but people are still kind of seeking out the approval or the affection or whatever you want to call it, they're still seeking out that blood connection. And I'm just like, it's not there. (laughs) It is not there. Beth is, is gone. Like let it go. And I think it was just, maybe it's because I, (laughs) I'm a bit callous. I don't always mean to be, but like, I just don't understand it. I don't understand this whole idea that family is more important than everything else. Like, your family treats you like crap. Like why, why would you give that kind of treatment, the benefit of the doubt just to say, Oh, I have a sister. Or, oh, I have, you know, uh, uh, my parents or whatever. So that whole blood is thicker than water kind of thing really, really annoyed me because it gets worse and worse as the season goes on. <laughs> I guess that was probably like, we, we were texting each other about that. And I said to you, I can see the other side of that. Cause yeah. I, I, don't want to say too much on here but like i have seen it in the real world where some people are just horrendous and because it is family people want to be loved by their family and yeah you know and like it and they they will just continue to forgive and forgive like and you know like i've seen it i've got a couple of friends who are in or have been in situations where even i like this is just crazy like but they but they but they love their parents or whatever it is or you know in re- other real world situations i've seen it and yeah people do do it people like you will you you know, you know like you almost smash your head against the wall thinking like why why do they just keep going back for more but right but, right but people but people like they you know it's it's a loved one and they want they want that love still you know so yeah um yeah like you know i i sort of can see that point of view but i guess 
when we're the the viewer of a TV show, seeing right, right. it, um, especially with Alice, who's clearly a murdering psychopath, there's got, there's a big difference between what I'm talking about in the real world of a of a sibling being horrible to another sibling or a, a parental figure being horrible to a parental figure, right. and still doing quite horrendous things, but not murdering people yes, like that. Of course. Like that. Yeah. Like, um, we're not advocating for psychopaths here no 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 like and some of these people like that i i i'm aware of in the world um even i think man there's gotta be a point where you just stop dealing with that person but oh, for sure can, but but i completely understand why people don't because yeah. they they want to be loved by that sibling um or sorry all that person that blood relative not I keep saying sibling but that blood relative uh, some of these people i'm not actually thinking of as siblings i'm actually thinking yeah. of them as parental figures but i think the um, problem is though like the 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 person has told you that they can't be what you expect them to be. And that's, well, yeah, that's the part that I don't get. Like they've they, already be, said that they can't be that for you. But people do that in a lot of actually in um, relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships. Like people are quite honest, you know, I am going to be who I am. And people like, so, you know, you even hear about this in relationships where like the, one of the spouses is, is cheat, cheats all the time, but, but the, but the other party just, keeps having them back because yeah. you know like uh, anyway we're uh, delving too much into we, you know we're going to become some sort of psychiatry <laughs> chat line in a minute but like yeah so um well i'm going to move on to what my next thing that i disliked so i mean it's quite a, a huge thing i uh, and especially for it being the actual character um i'm not sure if it's batwoman uh, there was a lot about bat actually no it was mainly batwoman there was so much i disliked about batwoman in the first season and the, literally, the I don't know what it was. I kept questioning what are the writers doing. Like, um, oh, there's just too much that I felt that the public knew about Batwoman. You know, from appearing on the front page of magazines to, I don't really see why they needed to know her sexuality because I don't think they should have even known anything about Batwoman. It should have, right. but she for me, been a symbol. Yeah, yeah, a symbol. That's it. That's all. Like, and if you look at any sort of Batman movie. No one ever gets close to Batman unless he's standing next to that spotlight on top of the Gotham precinct. Right. Like, and even even then, you know, Commissioner Gordon, who always deals with Batman, barely knows anything about Batman. You know, like he, Batman is a mysterious figure. Like you say, he's a symbol rather than a person. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like there was way too. I, I felt like Ruby Rose, to be honest, played Batwoman way too flat. Um, you know, with no real character when she's played. You know, you couldn't tell the difference between when she was Batwoman and and, Ru- and, and Kate Kane. It mm-hmm. just was the same person. Um, and I just, I, f- I feel like when you're a Bat character, you're supposed to be mysterious. It's almost yes. to the, po- almost to the point of is Batwoman real? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, like, and that's, and that's how, how a Bat character should be. Right. And it, and it, and it just was ridiculous, you know, just within the first season, the whole of Gotham knows about Batwoman. I right. just, you know, it should be that by the end of season one, that maybe somebody may have seen her like yeah. jumping across a roof or something, you know, like, I don't know, like, you know, and I think it should have been, there's so many moments in the comics where like Batman does have a street, um, a fight in the street and people are like, Oh my God, you know, Batman's real, like, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it's, and, it, and then he's gone again or whatever. And, and that's a, and it's seen as like a big moment. And yeah. um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I didn't like how they handled Batwoman in the first season. And I really hope that season two handles Batwoman very differently, yeah. but I'm not convinced. <laughs> that's funny because that's actually one of my beefs too. It's how many freaking people know that Kate Kane is Batwoman, but it goes back to Batwoman having way too much visibility as like the, it's almost like they're trying to humanize Batwoman, which at the same time, yeah, yes, she is a human, but at the same time, like again, you're you're supposed to be this vigilante crime fighter. You're not supposed to be doing photo shoots and 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 that kind of stuff. Like, and I mean, I understand the hacker teenager Parker that they pulled in, and I understand why they pulled her in, but like. Does a does a sixteen year old really need to know who Batwoman is? Like, does a sixteen year old that has nothing to do with any of the other people involved need to know that Kate Kane is Batwoman? Like, I, I I was very annoyed with that. Like, and it's it's sort of like a running joke, I guess, in the in the Arrowverse at this point because that was pretty much what happened in the Flash. It was kind of like who doesn't know that Barry is Flash at this point? Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't like that. I I don't like the superhero identities being revealed to too many people. I, I think it should be 
you know, I, not everybody can be a Tony Stark. Like Tony Stark makes enough money that he can protect himself and the people that he loves. But like all of these other people, like the whole world doesn't need you to sit there and, and get on national TV and be like, I'm, you know, I'm Iron Man. Like I, 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 so I'm with you on that one. I, I hated the way that Batwoman became this sort of, I don't know, personal figure, I guess. It was almost like, to... so, Batwoman was almost like a celebrity. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, what, like she rescued one woman and she goes, oh, I'd ask you for a selfie, but I think you're needed elsewhere. And she's yeah. like, mate, and then Batwoman says, maybe next time and then shoots off. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, it's cringe. Like, yeah. um, <laughs> okay, so that brings me to my next dislike, which probably feels minor compared to everything else. It's just my dislike of not showing enough of Gotham City. Mm. Um, now, I don't just mean the city... It, well, I do mean the city, but like parts of the city, like the Narrows. I was thinking about things like Gotham City Police Station, um, but also if we're saying that there's Batman and we're saying that there was the Joker, you know, where's Robin? Where's Nightwing? Where's you know other characters? Yeah, where are the other are? heroes in Gotham? Yeah, yeah. What happened to all of them? You know, yeah. like, and I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they should be regulars, like, but it would be cool, like, if in an episode or something like Dick Grayson did show up and gave his blessing, like, cause, but where's, you know, Batman's gone, but maybe, yeah. you know, maybe in the likelihood that Batman disappeared, normally Dick Grayson in the comics has taken on the mantle of Batman. Yeah. Um, so why didn't those things happen? Do they or just... maybe these other heroes are just better at keeping themselves hidden. Like they should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Batwoman. Uh, I, yeah. I would just, I would like to see more of the city. Gotham City is a character in, a, in itself. It's one of the most well-known cities ever. Like, mm-hmm. And I would like to see more of the city, but also more of the people that we know, um, yeah. or at least an indication of what potentially could happen to them. And I, I'm not saying I want them to regular cast members. I know no TV network has, has the, well, no, I mean, things like Game of Thrones obviously has the budget for huge cast, but CW doesn't have the, the budget for like a 30-member cast. But yeah. to just have maybe an episode or two where you do have Dick Grayson showing up or whatever would be quite cool to see. So. Yeah. Or that could be your excuse to pull in the, the uh, HBO characters that used to be on DC universe. You've yeah, already well, got could... them there. Like just kind of bring them over as sort of a crossover. I, well, I, I think they're meant to be on like a parallel earth or something, but you could have the oh, okay. actor play a CW version of, of Dick Grayson. So yeah. What I thought was cool about the location um, is the exterior shots are actually of Chicago, which is where Nolan filmed his Batman movies. Um, and it's the first time I've seen CW use a city other than Vancouver as its backdrop. Now, uh, they still filmed this on sound stages in Vancouver, but all of the exterior shots were of Chicago, which I thought was really cool. Um, one, of, one of my other dislikes... Uh, speaking of the other heroes, uh, I really did not like any of the other villains in this series. Um, I did not like Magpie, did not like Hush. I didn't like Arkham in general. I thought every other villain in this Batwoman first season was weak in comparison to Alice. Um, and maybe that was intentional from from them. But I am the type that I the, the villains are usually my favorite. So the fact that I only had one villain I could get behind... Uh, that just it, it bugged me like anytime someone else other than Alice or Mouse was on screen and they were a bad guy I was just like I don't care like, I, I don't care about you you don't have you don't have the charisma you don't have the charm I, I'm just I'm not interested in in what you have going on so I was really disappointed with the other villains in the series I think and linking in my my next dislike actually was mainly associated around the character of Tommy Elliot Hush. Um, so I love Hush in the comics. Like Hush's introduction in the comics was amazing, and I love Tom Thomas Elliot and just his whole connection with Bruce Wayne. And actually, he's set up as quite a, a decent modern villain that's been introduced in the last sort of fifteen years. And he was like when he became Hush with the 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 sort of the bandages around his face he honestly looked like hush from the comics i was like cool 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 you know but actually he turned it out to be just a sort of sap that said what alice <laughs> you know went, went along with whatever alice said there's no way hush would have done any of that stuff i mean in most of the comics my um the batman villains are kind of almost on equal par yeah depending depending i guess who was taking center of that story you know if it was a joker type story normally joker's a center but if it's a 
I don't know, Killer Croc type story, you'll, you'll find that Killer Croc's kind of taking the, the reins on this story. And like, you know, Hush has not been a character that I've ever read a story where he is kind of a second par villain. He, he's, you know, he's not up there, I guess, with Joker, but he is a top one, I would say, like a top par villain. Like, mm. um, so I was sort of disappointed to see he came across as a bit of a sap, really, in terms of how he was with Alice. So. Yeah. Um. Uh, another thing that I didn't like was the underutilization of Mary and Luke. I just felt like L- Luke played almost too much of a stereotypical nerd. Um, if you sort of were to put them in a room together, like, would you really be able to tell the difference between Luke and Cisco? I mean, if you didn't, if you weren't like looking at them physically, like they just, they kind of have the same type of personality, same feel, like, Oh, the super hyperactive nerd that has like a dark past. Um, and it's kind of like, we, we've done that before guys, like, come on, do something, do something different. And I, and not necessarily a fault of the series itself, but just like the way that the characters kind of mistreated Mary really, really bugged me. Like they almost didn't treat her like she was on the same level as the rest of them. And it's like, hello, she's running, at, I'll be in an illegal, but she's running in a legal clinic. Like, what are you talking about? She's not on par with the rest of you. Like she should be, you should definitely be utilizing Mary for what she is. Um, so I, I, I didn't like that Mary and Luke kind of were just fluff, so to speak. Yeah. Um, although I feel that they were stronger actors than Ruby Rose. But, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I disliked actually the part where, like you said earlier about Batwoman and the sister Alice um, or, or Beth, um, how Ruby, uh, Kate Kane's so desperate to get Beth back. And there was this particular episode where Kate Kane actually had finally started to get Alice and her to become, I guess, like sisters in, the, in a, you know, again and formed like a, um, an arrangement where they te- did a team up and actually it was a very nice episode between the two of them and you know kate kane's been desperate to get her sister back and the whole episode was about them kind of forming that bond together and they went to do a rescue uh, mission um she was working with our alice to help her with mouse and she goes into the cage to get mouse out and kate kane locks the door or locks her in there and now don't get me wrong, Alice is a criminal. She does need to serve time for all of these horrendous murders. Yeah. But she had started to form this bond of her sister. And I was just really disappointed that she just instantly turned on her and how she, you know, how did she not think that was going to go so badly? A, their relationship, but B, Alice just resorts back to type again um, and becomes the murderous villain and, and actually now is p- plotting an even bigger you know, yeah. thing, and, and actually this probably leads her down a dark path of, you know, she can't move away from revenge and, and leads to eventually the death of Mouse. Um, I, I honestly think there should have been a different approach here with Kate Kane's character, uh, sorry, Kate Kane's interaction with Alice. Yeah. Um, and, and then what I find highly ironic is that Kate Kane is shocked that her da- <laughs> that, 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 like towards the end of the season that her dad betrays her um, as obviously the colonel towards Batwoman and I'm like yeah. well you betrayed your sister and that was all okay and now, yeah. and, and now you're upset that your dad's betrayed you well you might need to get over that yeah <laughs> like, exactly. So exactly I, I was sort of yeah I disliked those two particular story arcs during, during yeah. season one I think the writers could have done something different there because Alice had said if you help me get Mouse we will leave town. And I think she would have left town. I think she probably still would have been trouble, but she would have at least left Gotham. And I think that maybe, that, maybe that Kate could have, could have gone with her. Well, not that, but like maybe they, that could have been their opportunity to build up a next villain for the next season. But instead their yeah. Alice is back as, you know, a villain for the second season as well. Maybe that wasn't planned, but yeah. um, so we'll move on to our likes. So I think, well, I'm pretty sure one like that Mark and I definitely have in common is Alice. We loved Alice. She is the best part of this entire season of Batwoman. Um, I love her personally because she is psychotic. She's a great villain, um, but she's great because she's so conniving and she's so, 
she's always so many steps ahead of everybody else that even the audience can't see her plans before they actually fall into place. Um, and I love, again, I love, love, love a good villain. And I just, I, I just love that no matter what kind of situation Alice is put in, she finds a way to get out of it, even including her being like in captivity for 15 years. Um, so that she, she was literally my favorite thing about Batwoman. I, I like, agree with you completely. So I, I think the actress Rachel, I could struggle with it. Is it Rachel Scarston? Scarston? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she's an amazing actress. And yeah. I don't know if you remember, but she played Dinah Lance in the um, one season show of Birds of Prey. Um, so she played um, uh, Black Canary. Okay, I didn't um, No, I only watched one episode of it, but she um, was very young back then. I think that was, uh, hold on, I did have it down. Uh, came out in 2002, so yeah, 20 oh, years wow. ago. <laughs> um, now, I thought she was amazing. Her, her acting is, I think, the standout of season one. Um, but and her character is so great. She is the Lex Luthor Joker of this show. Yeah. Um, and that's why, like you say, in some ways, it would have been nice for her to have maybe disappeared a little bit and then come back later. Yeah. Because uh, one thing I really hate is overdoing a villain like right. they have in Black Lightning with Tobias. Tobias in season one and two. By the time season three come along, honestly, I'm so done with Tobias. Yeah. But like, um, in fact, I enjoyed season three a lot more because Tobias was in it less. Yeah. I've got nothing wrong with a main villain who comes and goes, but when he's just always there, it just becomes a bit silly. Um, but Alice is just amazing. I, I, I loved Alice. I thought she was just brilliant. You know, I, I just, yes, yeah, just, you know, I can't rate enough. But I do hope during season two she will disappear. Um, you know, I don't mind her coming back down the road. Yeah. Um, but you just like don't want her to be the be in every overall episode. villain for the series, yeah. but we can probably bring in some other people at this point. Yeah. 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 Um, another thing I liked about the series is that they were very upfront from the, from the beginning before they even filmed anything that. Batwoman, they were bringing Batwoman to series and Batwoman was going to be a lesbian and they were going to pick a lesbian to play Batwoman. And I love that they stuck to their guns with that. Um, and I, I know you didn't like Ruby. I kind of, I mean, I don't mind Ruby Rose. Like she, she, you know, she probably was one of the weaker links as far as acting goes in the entire series. Uh, but I, I just, I really enjoyed that they, they didn't kind of back their way out of it. Sort of like it was not just, uh, we mentioned it once at the very beginning of the series and then we never ever talk about her being a lesbian again. Um, it, was, it was just, it was always there. And um, it only came up, I guess twice. Like there was a, a little bit of opposition in the series when once with the restaurant owner that didn't want gay women at his restaurant. And then another time with the, the police commissioner didn't want to turn on the bat signal after he found out that Batwoman was gay. Um, but, but her being gay and being like, so to speak out and proud is one of the things that I, I really enjoyed that they were bold enough to do it without, without falling into all those tropes where it's sort of like the barrier gaze where like someone comes out as gay and then they die in the next episode. Um, so that was, that was enjoyable. Mm. I, I like the fact that actually they did have a main character who is gay as well. Like, I agree with you. Like, and so in the comics, Kate Kane is gay and um, it was great that actually CW and, you know, a big network television show like the CW have said, yeah, no, that's it. You know, lead character is gay, you yeah. know, yeah. watch it or don't watch it, you know? Yeah. Um, so the thing that I enjoyed, um, like we said, we both agreed about Beth, uh, sorry, Alice, um, uh, well, Beth Ellis. Um, the thing that I absolutely love following on from that, really, I'll start with actually the my second one was Crisis on Infinite Earths. And I know you didn't watch all of that, but I absolutely love the whole of Crisis on Infinite Earths and Batwoman's relationship in that. Um, so seeing her with Kevin Conroy on the alternate earth where he's the older evil Batman, um, that, that interaction was really cool. So Kevin Conroy is the voice of Batman in the animated series. Um, but I really love as well, Batman, sorry, Batwoman's um, relationship with Cara Danvers, AKA Supergirl. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I like, so we saw it in the previous um, crossover event before Batwoman started. And Supergirl does throw a line to Batwoman about world's finest, which is what they always refer to as Batman and Superman. So it was quite cool to see, you know, that interaction as well during crisis of those two. And there's, there's a few, there's a sort of a confrontational moment between Kara and Batwoman over Kryptonite, which actually plays out later on in season one of Batwoman. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I love this. I just love the two interactions between these two strong. Well, Kara for me is a very strong um, character and um, is played very well. And uh, it was unfortunate that she was meant to guest star actually. And I think it was episode 20 of Batwoman, but because of COVID, they couldn't do that. So instead they had to reference Supergirl instead. Um, yeah. They, yeah. They had a flashback in that episode with the Kryptonite. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I I don't know. I was I I just loved Whole of Crisis and Batwoman's interaction in that. I thought it was good, and especially at the end where they kind of made a little bit of a Justice League of of, of them all. So <laughs> um, at some point, go back and watch those five episodes. Yeah, because uh, doing this season watch, I skipped over episode nine, which is the episode that references Christ or that is the Crisis episode for Batwoman. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Technically, I only watched 19 episodes, but still. Um, so another one of the things that I liked, uh, and kind of in keeping with the theme of like her being a lesbian and that being normal, uh, there are so many times where you're watching a, a TV show and it's like, oh, like you're 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 gay or you're a lesbian, like you're a unicorn, and it's like, there, there's, I mean, there's nothing special, like. It, it, your sexual preference does not make you some kind of magical creature that deserves all of this special attention, you know? Um, and I also loved that they treated Kate Kane the way that they treat like their male leads. And if, if I compare Kate Kane to Oliver Queen, she's, she's a playboy just as much as he is, you know, like Oliver Queen hooked up with so many characters in the first season of Arrow. Like how, the first episode of Arrow starts with him on a plane with uh sarah who is uh laurel's sister like we started out this whole series with you cheating on your girlfriend with your girlfriend's sister um so i i like that kate gets to have those kinds of relationships too like she had the relationship with reagan or regan um and then uh an old fling comes along in uh alfred's niece granddaughter i can't remember julia julia pennyworth um and of course uh the Kate's relationship with Sophie so it's it's nice to see that it's normal I guess is is the point that I'm trying to make is that they normalize Kate and she's yes she's a lesbian but she has the same kind of relationships that like everyone else has or that straight people have like there's no there's no magical unicorn aspect to her sexuality which is is something that that is nice to see because you don't get to see that too often I mean, I've said this before, like not in here, but like in real life. I mean, I'm obviously straight, but it would be amazing, I think, as a world to be in a place where we don't have to have it that people come out. Like, yeah, exactly. That, that people, that, that it's just that, that, that you're out, that you're out, you know, right. like I don't have to go on Twitter and say I'm straight. Like, right. so it's a shame that people do have to do that. It's just can't people i guess it depends but i guess it's just acceptance of society and i think society still isn't in the place of full acceptance of of everybody yeah. uh, it doesn't have a, it's still not fully inclusive so yeah. but with the whole um kate kane essentially hooking up with different people that that yeah i mean when i watched it i did feel the writers did handle that well um yeah. it wasn't you know there was no shame or anything it was just that's who she is like and yeah. it was you know like and, and people didn't treat her differently like for right, doing exactly, it exactly exactly so, like i guess like you say with oliver queen no one treated him differently yeah so it was good to see that the writers treated kate kane's character in the same manner yeah or um, you know bruce wayne like i mean bruce wayne was yeah, yeah. ultimate playboy right so yeah, yeah. I, I appreciated that. Like, like I said, that they didn't treat it as, oh no, you're a lesbian. So you can't do, you can't do that. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so my other thing that I liked was all of the other CW shows um, really played off of the crisis and infinite earth. So when crisis and infinite storyline finishes, all the other shows have had something changed um, when they come back. Like, so 
I won't, I won't go into that storyline, but there's this big event at the end and, and the reality is slightly different. Now, Batwoman in its first season, I did think to myself when we come back from this, are they really going to go and kind of reboot, alter Batwoman? Because we've only had 10 episodes. So that would be weird um, to suddenly alter history. Um, I guess they could have done it. Um, but what they did do, which I thought was quite cool, was they brought in an alternate Earth version of Alice, um, the Beth that never fell off the bridge, the one that Kate came rescued. And we get to see what she would have looked like and been like had had she have not fallen off the bridge and been kidnapped and essentially been kidnapped by a psychopath. So this Beth was really lovely and really nice. And I'll be honest, either the moment we met her, I was like rooting for her. Like, and there's an unfortunate thing that happens where Kate Kane has to choose between saving Beth or saving Alice. And she does choose Beth, the sister that she always wished she had. Yeah. And and I, I I couldn't believe that they killed her off. Like I literally was like, oh, just when she got shot, I was just I, even I was devastated. Yeah. Um. How, however, you know that I think it was handled well by the actress who is suddenly Alice is like when she comes out, going, you know, you were going to kill me. Like, yeah. You know. So yeah, no, it it was it was a good it was a good side effect that they did without rebooting the show. It was a nice twist that they brought brought in a Beth from another Earth. Yeah. I I did enjoy her and it was really sad when, when she didn't make it. Um, Another thing that I loved again, goes back to me and my love of villains. I actually really enjoyed mouse. Um, He, he was weird and he was unstable, but as the series progressed, he goes from this kid that's also in a crappy situation. He's the kid that uh, his dad is the one who kidnapped Beth. Um, and so, but his dad is abusive to him as well. So it's sort of one of those things where you have these two kids locked in an impossible situation, um, but they form a bond. But as they get older and as Alice's need for revenge against Kate and her father gets deeper and deeper, you can see Mouse and Alice pulling away from each other. And it's unintentional because when when they finally get to a point in Arkham where they have taken over the asylum, Mouse is happy. And he flat out says that he's happy. They have a roof over their head. They get three square meals a day. Nobody's looking for them. They're not on the run. They have, you know, they finally have a spot and they're in control. So, you know, they're in charge of, basically it's literally the inmates running the asylum. And... <laughs> It's, it's, it's heartbreaking at the very end to me, like as, as Mouse finally grew on me and then for him to, to voice like, Alice, you really need to let this go. Like, I want to move on and, and go and do our own thing. Like we need to go so we can build our own wonderland. And he's like, but we can't do that as long as you have this vendetta. And, and I, I want you to stop because if you don't stop, then I'm just going to go without you. And it shows that how far he has come from that shy, scared kid to being like basically independent, which is something that Alice kind of overlooks because she forgets that he got when, I guess when things fell apart, because they never really tell you how she escapes uh, from the, like the house burns down because she sets the, the mother on fire. But like, other than that, they don't tell you what else happens, but somehow Mouse gets captured and Mouse spends five years in Arkham before Alice breaks him out the first time. And it's just like, he literally is like, you you think I can't do this without you? Like I spent five years in Arkham on my own without you before we got, you know, before you found me again. So don't tell me that I can't do this. And so to finally see him come into his own and become his own person, not wearing a mask, not relying on her not being dependent on someone else to help him um and then to just kind of get all of that taken away because she poisons him at the very end it was just it was really heartbreaking so like i i came to like mouse a great deal by the time the the series ended or Uh, the the season ended i agree with you about mouse i felt for him when he got attached to this fake life in the um asylum 
And and then when she, when she killed him off, Alice killed him off. I I could see that coming a mile off. But yeah. when that happened, I was just like, this is a shame. Alice is yeah. more committed. This is actually a, such a stereotypical thing in so much media, like revenge ruling mm-hmm. the character. Reve- basically, revenge has taken over Alice, and yeah. she, all she can see is revenge now. Um, so, but. To move on to the next thing I loved was, although I did say that I felt Hush was weak and Tommy Elliott was weak, I love the fact that he has changed, his face has been changed, and this is the cliffhanger ending at the end of episode 20, Yeah, um, is that he has taken on the face of Bruce Wayne. Now, why I love this is because the CW has so shied away from Bruce Wayne and Batman over the years. Like even in Arrow, they had to, um, they made, uh, they said Bruce Wayne's name in an episode of Arrow. They actually had to go uh, to the CW to ask permission for that. So to see how far the CW have come to be able to put Bruce Wayne in, in a TV show is amazing. Now I know this isn't the Bruce Wayne or the Batman, but it is somebody with Bruce Wayne's face. So going into season two, I'm hoping this does go. In. I hope they don't drop this because there must be. A oh, gap. no, there's no way. Tommy is egomaniacal. Like he's going to eat up the fact that he gets to be Bruce Wayne. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that essentially it's going to be. I'm assuming there's a gap like a three or three to six month gap after season one to allow for to whatever has happened off screen to have happened. So yeah. I, I'm assuming that he's probably, they're not going to, I don't think they'll drop it, but I'm assuming he's got his feet well under the table at uh, uh, Wayne Enterprises and probably living the high life as Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love the fact that Bruce Wayne is in a TV show. I know it's not the Bruce Wayne, but this does it's start. The, but it's the start though. And does this mean we could at some point have Batman in a TV show. Yeah. It could be a season or two away, like, you know, but it's amazing for me. It's a good step. Yeah. And I think the, the last bit that I loved about Batwoman is cliche or whatever, call it what you want, but I loved the powerful women. I mean, uh, Sophie had to make a really, really hard choice uh, at the very beginning and she chose her career above everything else. And at some point toward the end of the the season, she's kind of like, I'm, I'm 29 years old. Like I'm not even 30. I have my dream job. I'm married, you know, like she, well, she, she's not married by the end of the season, but still Uh, she, but she's basically like, I'm not even 30 yet. And I am living the exact dream life that I had thought that I had laid out for myself when I was much younger. Um, and I think it takes a special kind of person to kind of make the sacrifices that are required to do those kinds of things. So even though it kind of hurt her in the end, when, when, you know, her marriage fell apart, she was married to a guy, but it turns out she still, you know, she still had feelings for, uh, other women. So I can, I can see her confusion, but I still think that Sophie is, is badass. So I loved Sophie. Um, I, I love Mary, uh, her opening that clinic to, because, you know, she, you know, they play her up at the very beginning of the season as like this social influencer, this ditzy rich girl that just kind of does things for show. And it turns out that she actually has a conscience and she's like, yes, I have all this money. Yes, I'm in medical school. And yes, I am a social influencer, but I use my money and my clout to do the things that I need to do to get the supplies that I need to get for this clinic and I help the people that Gotham General turns away. So I love that she's literally a college student that is running an illegal underground medical clinic and she will help anybody that comes through the door. No questions asked. Um, and I think that is super ballsy. Uh, and then of course, Alice. I love Alice. Like she, she literally clawed her way out of hell. She ha- survived a car crash, was kidnapped by a psychopath, had to see uh, all kinds of horrible horrible things but she still managed to come out of it now less sane than when she went into it but she still managed to claw her way out of so many different shitty situations um and essentially come out on top because she's still the queen bee of gotham at this point my last favorite thing actually is one of your favorite women (laughs) actually i just love sophie she is such a great character to me She's just so strong. I loved her character arc, you know, going from, like you say, starting off married 
in a relationship that she clearly didn't want to be in and, and seeing her evolve and actually mm. even going up against her parents to stand up for her own beliefs. And right. I just thought, even though I loved how kick ass she was and, you know, when she sort of rebels from the crows and going off on her own and, and you know, going up against um, uh, Colonel Kane and, and, you know, saying, you know, like she, she stood up for her beliefs that Batwoman actually wasn't the bad guy that he was making out her to be. Yeah. Um, and something I really was thinking was what I felt would have been a natural story evolution. I'm sure that Javicia Leslie is going to be great, but I felt like actually she would make a really great Batwoman. And it and to me, it would have felt like a natural part of the story. Like something happens to Kate Kane, mm -hmm. you know, her former lover. Like, why why wouldn't she become Batwoman? You know, right. like it, it would be a natural step for me. Um, however, yeah, you know, I didn't sort of get why we've created a new character, Ryan Wilder, you know, but I'm I'm really, you know, I'm gonna give season two a go. Like, but I just felt like Sophie was so, so badass. I would have loved to have seen her as Batwoman. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool. Yeah. So that brings our likes and dislikes to a close. And <laughs> overall, we did feel that the show was very jumbled. Um, so we've given it a 2.5 out of 5. Yeah. We've both watched the trailer for season two. We're not going to go into that massively, but I'm really excited. And Javicia looks so much stronger than Ruby Rose. Like, yeah. the, and she looks like she's so much more confident and having fun with that role. In that one minute trailer, I just love the bit where she's upside down and she's like, boo. <laughs> like for, for me for me that's like batman type type stuff you know yeah. like that and that's the kind of thing i wanted to see in the first season like yeah not not to be like batman i want batwoman to be her own character but just to have some fun with being batwoman and actually show a difference between being kate kane and being batwoman i yeah. just felt like there was no difference and i really want to see javicia be her own character as ryan wilder Mm -hmm. but be a slightly different character as Batwoman. Yeah. Um, it, you know, that's the whole point, having a secret identity, you know. Exactly. Like, it's a like, secret. <laughs> yeah. That's why, like, we, you know, with Clark Kent, people people joke about the glasses, but it's not just the joke of glasses. He plays a bumbling idiot as Clark exactly. Kent. Exactly. Uh, um, but as Superman, he's this cool dude that everyone wants to be friends with like yeah. you know um you know he's mr he's mr charming as superman and then clark kent he can barely tie his shoelaces together right so people it's not the glasses that people that, that confuse people it's he is two characters yes and um well and if you think about smallville smallville didn't even kind of get into that whole thing until the very end and they had what a nine eleven season run and at ten, the very seasons, I think 10 seasons okay so, yeah. and then the very end is when they finally name him superman so we had 10 seasons of this building and building and building and still it was so many different ways they could have done this i really hate it's like you get to know who batwoman is and you get to know who batwoman is and everybody can know who batwoman is like this is stupid guys i i i'm i'm actually hoping that the season two will go into this incorrect like sort yeah of i think massive they've mistakes. done a good job of laying the groundwork in season one um and i think I'm, you know not to sound mean about it but like if if you've gotten rid of what you consider to be your weakest link the side characters are actually pretty strong and pretty interesting all by themselves so you already have a great uh a great cast to work with so so putting in like you said a, a stronger character to kind of lead everybody and take mm. charge i think it it could be uh, miles and miles better than the first season mm. I'll finish that there and moving on to our recommendations so it was a pretty full week with uh that texas blood and batwoman however i did have time to finally finish season 12 of doctor who which i've worked my way through over the last two weeks um if you've not seen any of the last two seasons of doctor who with jodie whittaker taking on the first female doctor um i would go check it out especially the last episode of season 12 which actually gives the doctor a origin story um which i thought was actually pretty cool um so i'll leave it there uh my recommendation is tied to the previous episode where we went just straight news and the game awards uh if you have never ever played mass effect i would suggest I waiting until the legendary edition comes out now if the legendary edition comes out and it includes all of the dlcs that you know came with the first three games 
I I am considering buying the Legendary Edition for PlayStation because every other version of Mass Effect that I've played has been on Xbox, one Xbox or another. Uh, but like, I love this game so much, the game series so much. And with new games on the horizon, it just popped back up. So Mass Effect, the original trilogy is my recommendation for this week. And as a reminder... Don't forget about our second podcast series where we tackle some of the most essential graphic novels of all time. Our third Late to the Party Book Club episode was Brian Lee O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Life. And we were joined by Robbie Billups of the Pop Culture Philosophers. That episode dropped uh, beginning of December, so please check it out. And our next graphic novel is going to be Monstrous Awakening. That episode is going to be coming out sometime early January 2021. Next week, we will have a very special, fun Christmas party episode. Um, We will be joined by Stephen Fox from Fox Storytelling, Robbie Billups of the Pop Culture Philosophers, and Peggy of Peggy at the Movies uh, to help us with this epic Christmas movie showdown. Uh, Please be sure to tune in for what should hopefully be a really hilarious episode to close out 2020. Yeah. And then after that, we are taking two weeks off for the holidays and we're going to be prepping some new and exciting features that we plan to introduce when we return in 2021. So thank you so much for taking this journey with us here at Geeks Unleashed. And we can't wait to see what 2021 brings. And you can follow us on social media. We're Geeks Unleashed on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And you can listen to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Podbean, Google, Apple, Spotify. We are everywhere. So give us a five star rating. Thanks for listening to both episodes this weekend and have a good week. Bye.